Hi, how are you? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. How about you? I'm fine. Thank you. So, can you tell me which JDK version you are using? Uh, I'm using Java 8 uh, in my project. Okay. And what are the features which you have used in your project? Uh, I've used uh, Lambda expressions, uh, streams, uh, default method, uh, functional interfaces, uh, then optional. So these are some of the features I've used. Uh, so, what is stream? A uh, stream is a sequence of objects. Uh, we can uh, traverse through a uh, sequence of objects using stream in Java 8. Okay. And what is sequential stream and parallel stream in Java 8? A sequential stream is where uh, your current stream executes uh, in one core, in one thread. Uh, in parallel stream, it gets executed on multiple cores. But uh, in sequential stream, your output is predictable. Uh, in parallel stream, we don't have... Uh, control over the output, but the final output uh, is predictable. So parallel streams are executed on multiple cores and sequential stream is executed on single core. Okay. And what are the intermediate operations which are available in stream or what are the terminal operations? Uh, intermediate operations that are available is uh, the filter method is one of the intermediate operation available in stream and uh, uh, collect is uh, the terminal operation. So intermediate operations are lazy. That means if you don't call find a terminal operation on your stream, then the intermediate operations are not executed. So if I write a stream dot filter only, uh, then uh, it won't execute uh, the filter operation until I collect the result, which is a terminal operation uh, in the in the stream. So terminal operations are not lazy, no. and uh, intermediate operations are uh, lazy. Okay. And what is the use of lambda expression? Uh, Lambda uh, Java by nature is uh, object oriented, but uh, if you want to do functional programming in Java, then we make use of um, Lambda expressions. Uh, we can do a lot of things. We can implement functional interface using our Lambda expression. We can write implementation of functional interfaces using our Lambda expression. Okay. How do you handle exceptions in core Java? Uh, to handle exception in core Java, I make use of uh, try, catch, and finally. So I write a try block in which uh, I write some code where exception might occur. And uh, I then write catch block uh, to catch the actual exception. And then finally block to do some cleanup activity after I uh, perform try and catch. So in finally, I generally release the resources in the finally block. No. Okay. So do you know what is try with resource? Uh, yes. Uh, so try with resource is a feature uh, in Java where I perform try and I pass one resource to that uh, try block. So this is the resource which uh, I need to release after performing a uh, try and catch. So for example, buffered reader. Uh, so I do try and I pass buffered reader, reader object uh, to the uh, try block. And once the try and catch is complete, uh, buffered reader is automatically uh, released. So the cleanup activity happens automatically. But there is one uh, requirement for this. Uh, the class that you pass as a resource to try should implement auto closable. So auto closable is an interface uh, that should be implemented uh, when you pass uh, the resource to a try block. Okay. And uh, what are the solid principles? Solid principles are the some of the best practices that we uh, do while writing the program. So solid is your single responsibility principle where your class should focus on one responsibility at a time. It shouldn't write or uh, you shouldn't write code from multiple functionality into one class. So that is single responsibility, one responsibility at a time in one class. So if you want to perform two responsibility, then you should write uh, two classes for it. So that is S. Uh, o is open close principle. Whenever you write a, a class, it should be open for extension, which means you should be able to inherit from that class and uh, do method overriding and writing some extra logic uh, in the new class or in the child class. But you shouldn't go to your existing class and make some code changes. So it is open for extension and close for modification. You shouldn't do any modification. Okay. At least you okay, are fine. Yeah. Yeah. So you have mentioned you know Spring Boot and microservices as well, right? Correct. So I have worked on no. uh, Spring Boot and microservices in my current project. Okay. Okay. So uh, let us start with the Spring Boot. Can you tell me how to insert a record into a database? Let us consider you have to create a project and uh, there is an employee table in database. You have to insert a record into that table by using Spring Boot application. So can you start from the scratch? like creating the project, then uh, there are different layers through which you need to go to the database. 
Okay. So first thing I'll do is uh, go to Spring Initializer website and uh, there I'll create a project. I'll add my package uh, structure or package name to that uh, website and add all the required dependency. Generally, the web dependency is added. And uh, if I want to do um, extra things, then extra dependencies will be added like service discovery, but I'm not taking that into consideration now. After that, uh, adding dependency, I'll download the project, which will be uh, in the zip format. So I'll extract the zip and uh, import that project into either my Eclipse IDE or IntelliJ IDE based on the IDE that I am using. After importing the proce uh, project, uh, I'll try to uh, write three to four layers in my application. So the first layer will be my REST controller. So I'll write a class as a REST controller and I'll annotate that class with at the rate REST controller. Uh, then I'll write a service class. So service class is where my business logic resides. So business logic will be written uh, in the service class and I'll annotate this class with at the rate service. Uh, then I'll write at the rate a repository. This will be my uh, uh, repository where I'll write my data access or uh, logic. And finally, I'll write models. Models are uh, classes that hold your data. So in the REST controller, I'll write various methods uh, to get, post, put and delete entities. So I'll write uh, methods and then annotate those methods with at the rate get entity, uh, sorry, get mapping, uh, post mapping, put mapping and uh, delete mapping. So this is what I'll, I'll do. Okay. Okay, fine. So you have worked on microservices. Can you tell me how to microservices communicate with each other? Yeah. So microservices uh, generally communicate over the network and uh, they use uh, REST uh, protocol, uh, sorry, REST implementation to do this communication. And this generally happens through REST template. So REST template uh, is one class provided by uh, Spring Boot, which is used to make a REST call and call another service and get the response. So I use REST template for communication. Okay. Let us consider there is a microservice which is taking a lot of time to consume the data from another service. Basically, it is a calling to a different microservice. It is taking a to complete that particular call. So how do you handle this situation? Okay, so uh, I'm calling another service. It is taking a lot of time to complete. Uh, so to handle this situation, I'll configure uh, timeout on my REST template. So while creating the bean of REST template, I'll uh, configure the timeout and the timeout is reasonable. Uh, for example, uh, suppose five to six seconds or max 10 seconds. So my call won't be blocked. So it will release the uh, call if it reaches the timeout and uh, that call will be uh, connection will be closed. Okay. What is horizontal and vertical scaling? Okay. So uh, horizontal scaling is where you have one application deployed on one machine and uh, that machine is utilizing a lot of CPU. In that case, I'll create one more instance and uh, uh, deploy my application to that another instance as well. So there will be two instances. Then I'll create one more instance if required. So this is horizontal scaling where I'm creating more instances of uh, new machines. And vertical scaling is where I have a 2 GB RAM machine and my application uh, wants more memory and uh, more CPU. In that case, I deploy my application to a 4 GB RAM and I completely get rid of my old machine. So I just increased the CPU, the RAM of the machine, uh, which is vertical scaling. And even if this is lesser, then I'll deploy my application to 8 GB RAM and get rid of 4 GB RAM machine. So vertical scaling is this. Okay. And what kind of database you are using? Uh, I am using MySQL in my uh, current project, MySQL database. So what type of scaling happens with MySQL? Uh, in MySQL, uh, vertical scaling happens. So we, if uh, we require more capacity or more processing, then we deploy our uh, database to a bigger machine. Okay. Let us consider there is only one database and that database goes down. Okay. So what will be your approach to solve this kind of problem? Okay. So uh, I have one database and so there is a master slave, uh, master slave kind of architecture that we follow. So whenever a uh, record is written, it is written to master, uh, it is written to a slave and then uh, the acknowledgement is sent to the client. So if master goes down, uh, the slave comes up, the so slave database comes up and uh, 
your application can now point to the slave. You don't have to change the URL that happens automatically in AWS cloud. So now master is down, slave comes up and a slave starts serving your requests. Okay. And how do you deploy your microservices? Uh, to deploy microservices, we are making use of uh, ECS, uh, Elastic Container Service in AWS. So Elastic Container Service is where we can deploy containers to our uh, AWS uh, uh, cloud. So we make uh, we build the image out of my application using Docker. So for building, we use uh, Docker build command. So the output of this is an image. So that we check in the image to uh, the registry of AWS, which is ECR, Elastic Container Registry. So after checking in, uh, we uh, create a template and we provide the path of that image. And uh, we, when we trigger the template, uh, services are created. And those services are uh, the instances which are uh, running in our uh, Elastic Container Service. And then um, we can use this uh, uh, microservice to serve the request from the clients. Okay. Are your microservices secured? Uh, my microservices are secured using uh, JWT, JSON Web Token. So we perform authentication and authorization uh, using auth code flow. So whenever user enters uh, the username and password, one auth code is generated. And based on that auth code, uh, we provide JWT to that user. And then the JWT is stored in your uh, Chrome browser. Uh, it is generally stored in your uh, either in cookies or uh, in some temporary storage. Okay. Okay. So what is the basic difference between authentication and authorization? Authentication is where uh, you provide username and password and you log into the system. Uh, so that is authentication where you know that you provided uh, authentication, uh, sorry, username and password and you are the right user. But there are various um, portion of your application which you want to access. Uh, there are portion one, two, suppose there is admin area, there is a uh, normal area. So if you want to access admin area, are you authorized to the access that area? So that means uh, if I'm not able to, if I'm not authorized to access the admin area and I'm trying to access the uh, admin area, so I'm not authorized. So this is authorization and authentication is where I have the credentials for accessing the application. Okay. You are working on MySQL database as well, right? Correct. Okay, let us consider that there is a query. Okay, and that query is making more time for the execution. Okay, so how do you approach to improve the performance of that query? Okay, so uh, the query is taking uh, longer. So I'll try to check uh, if uh, the columns that I am using in the uh, where clause, if uh, there is an index on those columns. So if there is no index, I'll try to create a non-clustered index on those columns. And I'll generally uh, make joins on my uh, primary key columns from the tables. Uh, and uh, if the join column includes the non-primary key uh, columns, then I'll also try to create indexes on those columns as well. So this is the first thing I'll try to do for improving the performance of my query. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you share your editor like Eclipse or Notepad or whatever you are comfortable with? Uh, yes, so I'm sharing my Eclipse editor. Are you able to see the Eclipse editor? I have also copied mm, yes. uh, the problem statement. Yeah, so from this list, you have to identify the highest number and you have to use Java 8 features. Okay, uh, this is okay, the list, so... uh, numbers list and I need to identify the highest number, which is uh, 9 in this case. All right, so yes, Java 8 correct. features. Uh, I can make use of stream. Uh, so stream is a uh, sequence of object and then I'll try to use uh, max. Max is where it takes a comparator. So it compares to integer and try to come up with the value. So I'll uh, pass to integer as i comma j. So these are the two integers and uh, I'll then just compare. I'll do compare to uh, i and pass j. So this is my implementation and uh, Finally, I'll try to get uh, to, uh, uh, get. So I'll try to get. So this will return me optional. Okay. So optional is a feature where the value can be present or value is not present. So two scenario might happen, and this will return integer in case of uh, successful operation. So this will be my uh, max. All right. So what what happened here? You cannot convert from app, cannot convert from integer to optional of integer. 
All right. So let me. Okay. So let me try to uh, run this program. This out or uh, max. Okay. So I'll run this program, and uh, I got nine. Okay. Perfect. That's it from my side. Do you have any question? Uh, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.